Catherine Dunn published two books in the 1970s. They were well received, but they didn't set the world on fire, and her third book was rejected by her publisher. In the 80s, she came back with a masterpiece, Geek Love, the disturbing story of a family of circus geeks, the horrors that they inflict upon their children, and the cult that they build around themselves. But Geek Love was the last book that Catherine Dunn would live to see published. She started to get into sports journalism and died in 2016. In 2023, her editors went back to her unpublished third novel, did, I think, a fair amount of work with it, and published it under the name Toad. Now, if you're going to read one book by Catherine Dunn, I wish I had a hot take here, but I don't. Geek Love is her best book. It has the best characters. It has the best story. It has the best writing. But maybe you've looked at Geek Love and said, yeah, no, that's not for me. Or maybe you've read Geek Love and you're saying, is there another book by this author that I should check out? Well, all three of these books have some things in common. They're all about women who are outsiders and who are struggling to find a way to live outside the boundaries of society. Second, all three books are obsessed with the body. On the one hand, how disgusting and repulsive it can be. And yet, on the other hand, how we hunger for it and try to satisfy it. And third, all, all these books are written by Catherine Dunn. I mean, she didn't write bad sentences. And if you're a writer, you will find something to admire in all of them. Beyond that, the three books almost belong to different genres. Attic is a stream of consciousness character study. Truck is a bit of a road story. and Toad is kind of a memoir. So your decision on which of these three books to read might be driven by which genre you relate to the most. Now for me, I, I'm going to do this from the bottom up, the book I connected with the least to the book I connected with the most or the one that I think the most about. And I guess at the bottom of this, I would put the recently published novel Toad. Toad is a story of a woman, now that she's a little bit older, middle-aged, maybe even verging on getting uh, into old age, she's gotten a little more comfortable with herself and the fact that she either is or at least feels very unattractive all the time, very much other from the people around her. But most of the book is a memoir of her looking back at the relationships she's had, and especially the relationship she had with a young couple named Sam and Carlotta back when she was a student in college. At the beginning of this book, I was just so happy to be back in Catherine Dunn's world. Now I own goldfish and am mean about flies. Yet our first encounter was on a real day such as these that still begin with the same glimmers, and there are no ends to the lengths that a scaled body might lead me to. Sam brought the clouds down and tickled them until they gave sarsaparilla. I drank it up and hated the hours when we were not together. It's so good. Likewise, the end of this book is super powerful. It has some scenes at the end that are going to stay with me for a very long time. In the middle, for me, she was recounting some of the things that happened to her and her friends. It, it was a bit of a slog. I had a hard time connecting with it as much. Two other things that are interesting about this book before I set it down. First of all, there is a scene in this book that is basically cut and pasted from Attic. Now, you can't plagiarize yourself. That's fine. But I did wonder, would Catherine Dunn have done this had she been alive when this book had been published? Second, I'm just going to start a conspiracy theory because the way in which Sally, the main character of Toad, gets her disability checks is very similar to the way the dad from Thomas Pynchon's Vineland gets his disability checks. And the two books would have been written about the same period of time. I think that Thomas Pynchon was in California at the time. Uh, obviously, Catherine Dunn was in Portland and in Oregon, so about the same area of the country, about the same time, two brilliant writers. Could they have known each other? Probably not, but, you know, these are the things you think about. Next, again, moving up from the one I connected with least to the one I connected with most, I would put Attic. Attic is the stream of consciousness story of a young woman who either was abused by multiple men in her life, or perhaps only had a mother who sort of convinced her that she was. I think either reading is probably supported by the text. She gets involved with a cult that forces her to sell magazines, somehow gets caught up in a check-passing scheme, and spends a short period of time in a women's prison. 
The first 30 pages of this novel are hard to get through. They are like Sound and the Fury level stream of consciousness writing, where you're just bouncing back and forth in time. The narrative becomes more linear. Once she actually gets to the women's prison, if you do attempt this book, even though it's short, I recommend sort of writing down the names of the people that she meets because there's so many different inmates in the prison. This book totally succeeds as a stream of consciousness, as a character study, as just an example of brilliant writing. There's not a whole lot of narrative arc. I mean, this is a person who unfortunately has to run a lot in order to stand still. I didn't think about it a lot after I finished reading it. Which is not true of Truck, which is a book that I can't get out of my head. Now, I was scared picking up this book. It is about a teenage girl who runs away from home to go see her friend who has moved to California, moved down to Los Angeles. Just knowing how Catherine Dunn sometimes treats her characters, I was afraid for this girl. The back of the book almost makes her seem like a Maddie Ross True Grits kind of character. It takes you on a journey into the mind of the feisty, adventurous adolescent named Jean Dutch Gillis. There are a lot of signs early on, though, that Jean Dutch Gillis is not just feisty and adventurous. She is a very disturbed young woman. She's manipulative. There's a scene early in the book, so I don't think it could be called a spoiler, where she kills a neighbor's pet. And so right away, you're cued into the idea that this person is not entirely reliable narrator, or at least she's a very disturbed young woman. Like Attic, the beginning of this book is pretty hard to get through. I wouldn't call it stream of consciousness so much as impressionistic, a bunch of scenes, some flashing forward and backward in time as Dutch prepares to run away from home. Once she settles down, gets on the bus, starts heading down to California, it becomes a little bit more linear. She gets down there, she meets her friend, they spend some time on the beach. This is a book that is obsessed with gender or the idea of what it means to be a woman, a man. It harps over and over again on the idea that Dutch is frequently mistaken for a boy, which she sometimes uses to her advantage and sometimes can be very frustrating for her. While her friend Haydorf is usually described almost like he's a frog, sometimes literally so. I don't have as much hair as he does. My sneakers are black with high tops and thick white soles and rubber toes. They think I'm his kid brother. And then talking about her friend, they are frog hands and want to fold on themselves the long way thin instead of in half the short way. They have no muscles, the tips are soft and splayed, frog fingers feeling themselves. He never notices them. So this is maybe the book where I saw both a character or a story that I could follow, as well as the writer that would go on to write Geek Love. It's just a really interesting portrait of her finding her voice. There's one more thing that I want to say about Truck, but it's a big spoiler. Not like a little spoiler, a major spoiler, one that I can't get out of my head. And so if you're considering reading it, this is a good time to shut off the video. I hope you found something in here that makes you want to dive into this author beyond geek love because she really was one of the best in American history. Now that that's over, in the last pages of this book, Dutch either imagines or admits to committing a murder while she was down on the beach, cold-bloodedly killing this couple that they met down there. Now, in some ways, I sort of said, yeah, that's consistent. Like, I could tell reading this book that she was not your average teen rebel. And there is a fair degree of time shifting. When did she leave? When did she get back? Where was she, when was she on the beach? When was she on the bus? However, on the other hand, like no matter how I do the timeline for this book, she wasn't in Los Angeles the day the murder occurred unless the cops really got it wrong. So I guess I've come to the conclusion that she's probably just fantasizing about having that level of power. And this is maybe a window into where this character might be going with her life. But it's totally possible that I'm wrong. That ending is one of the things that I've tossed over and over in my head, and it's one of the reasons why I liked this book so much.